Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. We'll just wait another two, three minutes for other attendees to join us. Thank you for the patience. Chandani, you want to show the screen? Hello? Hello? Yeah, yeah, doctor. Okay, yeah, you want me to show the screen to you now? Yes. Okay, okay. Thank you, doctor. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Swami. Uh, and we'll start our webinar now. So uh, good afternoon, everyone, once again. Uh, thank you for joining this webinar. My name is Dr. Chandni Parihar, and I'm Marketing Manager with Tron Nutrition India. Uh, with us from Tron Nutrition India team, we have today uh, Dr. Saurav Shekhar, our MD, Dr. Bridj Mohan, our Sales Director, Dr. Sujit Kulkarni, our Feed Editors Director, uh, doctor, uh, along with our presenters for the day, Dr. Swami Haladi, who is our global program manager, Dr. Sabiha Kadri, our technical head, and Mr. Avinash Bhatt, manager, Master Lab India. Before we begin with the webinar, Dr. Saurav Shekhar would like to say a few words. Thank you, Chandni. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining this webinar. Uh, our, our objective for doing this webinar on managing the mycotoxin risks during monsoon is one is seasonally relevant and we see that the challenges surmounts during this period of time and mycotoxin is a very broad subject uh, to be very frank and you everyone who is participating in this webinar is much more aware than us the opportunity what i see is that we have our global expertise which is again inculcated into the regional one and uh, now with dr swami being the global program manager for uh, mycotoxins i think this helps India as a country very fantastically well because he brings in the local perspective from the global point of view. And we share our learnings, which comes from Latin America, developing country, developed countries, and emerging countries like India, where we face this as a major challenge. So I think uh, this will be a good interaction. Uh, our, our only request for all the participants, I know that uh, you people had taken time and I see quite senior people joining in this webinar, which is which is again a good learning experience for us, sharing your experiences and learning from that will be an added advantage for doing this webinar. So looking forward for a very interactive session uh, and thank you very much for taking your time out from your busy schedule to attend this. I am sure that it will add value to your business and to your experience, overall experience. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Shan. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, before we uh, welcome our presenters for the day, uh, just a few instructions for the attendees. Please keep your audio on computer audio in order to ensure that you are able to hear our presenters clearly. Uh, we will also be taking up all the questions uh, during the last part, during the last 15 minutes. However, if you do have questions for us in between, you can always raise your hand or you can type in your questions in the question box and we'll be taking up those questions. Uh, now welcoming our presenters for the day, uh, Dr. Swami Haldi, who is our Global Program Manager for Mycotoxin Risk Management, and he has 17 years of experience with a PhD from University of Guelph in Canada. Dr. Swami has worked extensively on mycotoxin risk management concepts. 
He has 14 peer-reviewed research papers on myco mycotoxins to date. Uh, Dr. Sabiha Kadri, who is our technical head, has almost 15 years of experience, and she has a PhD from IVRI and has worked extensively on nutritional management concepts, providing advice on feed cost management, raw material quality, and feed additives management. Uh, our third speaker is Mr. Avinash Bhatt, and he has 20 years of experience in analytical laboratory analysis and R&D. Uh, welcoming our presenters to please present. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chandani. And uh, I would like to welcome all of you uh, for the, this presentation. And I think as Saurabh mentioned uh, uh, early on uh, that, uh, you know, it is not any a, a new science. We all know, especially Indian, uh, you know, industry knows a lot about mycotoxins. I just want to bring a little bit different perspectives, uh, uh, you know, from the global point of view and some of the new learnings uh, we have. Uh, and uh, also some of the you know, rapid testing, which are becoming a key part of our, our program. Uh, so uh, my presentations uh, basically will cover three different aspects uh, today. And uh, you know, one aspect would be, uh, what are the, some of the factors that influence mycotoxin production? This is very relevant for today because the monsoon rains are also one of the reasons or factors for the mycotoxin production the kind of moisture it is creating, the kind of humidity is creating is play an important role. So I will touch upon a little bit on that. And, uh, you know, also, uh, I think you all are experiencing today that it is not easy to recognize the problem of mycotoxins in poultry, particularly. So it's very difficult for you, you know, is it really a mycotoxin problem? Is it a pathogen problem? Is it, you know, nutritional problem? So I'll try to touch upon that uh, a bit. And then I move on to the you know, mycotoxin analysis. Uh, it is a very good tool, uh, but I also will challenge you. Is that mycotoxin analysis, is it everything? You know, can it give a complete picture? And so I, 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 will, I would like to do that uh, today as a group. And then, uh, uh, you know, Avinash will go on, do on the demonstration of MycoMaster, uh, very rapid uh, tool we have. And, you know, MycoMaster is just, a, just an instrument but the output coming out of that MycoMaster, you know, how we use that to educate the market and how also uh, customers who are connected to our database, what kind of advice uh, they are getting uh, from this uh, advisor, uh, what we call the NutriApt advisor, uh, we, will, uh, we will present uh, that as well. And then finally, uh, we all know that managing mycotoxins is not a simple thing. I don't think anyone can manage the mycotoxins completely. And I don't think anyone can say the feed is completely free from the, from the toxins uh, because the fungus is ubiquitous. It is there uh, everywhere. Uh, but, you know, I will give you uh, some of the, you know, I generally talk about 10 different points of, uh, uh, you know, uh, mitigation of mycotoxins, which I will touch upon slightly. Uh, due to the lack of time, I may not be able to go deep into those. Uh, but I will touch upon some of the key issues. And if anyone wants in-depth information on those, I can always uh, come back to you and conduct a, in a specific seminar for you or your team. And then, uh, you know, the, uh, the R&D, I am also responsible for developing new technologies within our organization. As a program manager, you know, I need to bring the challenges from the field, from people like you, and then take that to the R&D level and find a solution. So we will uh, discuss a little bit more on our approach on our, uh, our talks of technology. So I'm just, I will uh, end up with a take home, take home message. And uh, to moving on, uh, you know, the, uh, there are many, many mycotoxins which we don't know. And uh, I don't think we just even try to learn the names. Uh, you can see right in front of you, uh, there are more than 500 mycotoxins that are known today. And every day, uh, scientists are discovering more and more of these uh, toxins. But we all know that no one can analyze those 500 toxins. Even if someone analyzes it, what is the message you can get from those toxins? It's a very complicated message. And whether all those toxins are really toxic to the chicken, that also nobody, nobody knows. So, but what we know is, we know that there are about six, uh, uh, five or six uh, toxins, uh, particularly uh, most of them belonging to the fusarium fungus, 
like Dawn, like Zeralaman, Fimonosins, uh, T2, uh, uh, they are very key and people know about them. And also we have, being a tropical country, India has learned a lot, or South Asia for that matter, including uh, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Pakistan, we all know that, you know, aspergillus toxins are, are, are a major uh, challenges uh, here. And then we have this penicillium toxins, uh, you know, ocrotoxin we see in India, it can be produced by the penicillium fungus or also aspergillus fungus. So uh, that is the relevance of uh, uh, that toxin to us. Citrinin uh, has done some research in India on this uh, uh, toxin also. And then ergot toxins may not be so relevant for India, uh, but sometimes, you know, in the sorghum, in the small grains like wheat and barley, we do come across the ergot toxins, uh, which can uh, cause the compromise the uh, productivity of, of poultry. So then moving on, uh, if you look at the, the sources of mycotoxins, we all know that, uh, you know, water is not contributing, the environment is not contributing so much to the mycotoxins. The major contribution is coming from the raw materials which we use in our feed. Uh, in India, obviously, uh, maize uh, is a major raw material. And, uh, you know, then uh, maybe in some cases we use wheat and rice also. So potentially that, that they are a source of uh, uh, mycotoxins. We use a lot of protein sources. I think India uses a n number of protein sources. So they contribute like soybean, sunflower. They all contribute to mycotoxins. And then byproducts is, I think that's going to be a future challenge for India because of the shortage of raw materials. We tend to use more and more byproducts in the future. We may import the GDG and you know, things like that uh, in the coming years. Uh, so the byproducts contributes uh, much more uh, than the uh, energy sources and protein sources to the total mycotoxin load. These are the major ingredients uh, for poultry. And uh, again, coming to the main topic of, of today is you know, how does the monsoon has an impact on mycotoxin production? And every season comes with a different challenges. Uh, rains are always good for us, but the time is, if it comes at a wrong time during the harvesting, that is a disaster for uh, our, you know, management of grains, which we have seen. Uh, you know, we still use a lot of uh, gunny bags. We do the sun drying and those call, uh, kind of practices we have exposed the grains uh, to the uh, rains and to the high moisture high humidity, don't have to have, uh, the, don't have the grains to be soaked in the water. If just uh, there is high humidity in the environment, the moisture is absorbed by the grains and the water activity goes up, uh, causing challenges. So again, after the harvesting, you move them to the storage places. Uh, how do you manage the storages? How do you manage the silos? Are we managing the uh, the, the movement of air inside the silos, are we managing the humidity, temperature, uh, you know, all those uh, plays a key role. And this is going to be much more difficult in the monsoon times compared to the other times because of the high humidity uh, we get a lot. And then some of these toxins, we, they do get into the animals, particularly, for example, T2 toxin, there are studies showing it gets into the eggs. And we know that, that in case of liver and kidneys, also uh, there is a transfer of uh, aflatoxins or ocratoxins. Uh, yes, poultry is relatively less sensitive to the uh, transfer of toxin into, the, into their products, uh, but we cannot say they're completely free from those uh, challenges. So next question, uh, you know, uh, being, being worked in India for long, I know that there is a saying, if you don't know what is the problem in the poultry, blame on the mycotoxins. Uh, and uh, I think that's what we do a lot of times. Uh, you know, when we don't know some reason, we don't, you know, we talk about mycotoxins. There is a reason uh, also for that, uh, because these mycotoxins always work in the background. They never, you know, I, I have not heard of uh, many cases where a aflatoxin is killing a chicken or a T2 toxin is uh, killing a chicken. It's a very, very rare phenomenon maybe happened back in 60s, 70s, when we are using a lot of uh, peanut, uh, peanut meal. But now the subclinical or uh, subtoxic, uh, you know, chronic toxicity is, is a much more common. Uh, the problem with that is there are no clear symptoms. 
you know, the, the drop in FCR, increase in FCR, or, you know, poor gains can be caused by a number of, uh, number of things. So that is the reason why, you know, feed is becoming the major source of a reason for us to say there is a problem or not. Uh, but that's not the only thing which I will touch upon uh, slightly later. However, when the toxin levels are high, I was just uh, uh, talking to Avinash a few days ago, and he is saying that he has received one dairy feed sample with the high levels of aflatoxins like ATP, PB or, or something. Yeah, obviously, when the levels are so high, you expect to see some classical, classical symptoms. I'm sure the uh, milk level of aflatoxin will be very high in that scenario. So, but in poultry, uh, I think, I don't think we see so many acute toxin, toxicity today. We don't see the oral lesions as much. We don't see the bad livers so much today. Uh, but what is the major impact is, uh, is on the immune system, is on the gut, gut integrity. Uh, so that is, these are all the reasons why it is not easy for us to, uh, you know, specify a problem through your mycotoxin. So why uh, chronic toxicity is hard to diagnose? It's, you know, you can compare the chronic toxicity to like a cancer. For example, cancer, you know, people until and unless they start showing symptoms, it's very, very difficult to diagnose the problem. The mycotoxins is pretty much comparable to that. Uh, uh, the reasons are many. The sampling error is a major problem. You know, even you do a fantastic job of using, let us say, Mycomaster or HPLC or LCM, whichever the one. But still, if you don't do a good sampling, uh, then the, the values mean nothing. And then there are, should be clear, uh, there are no clear animal symptoms, I explained already. And there are many toxins, uh, which is, you know, it is not one. And today, uh, I think uh, one of the surveys is showing about 60% of the samples will contain two or more mycotoxins. Uh, and there are so many which are still undetected. Uh, causing uh, causing a total a total problem. The, recently in Europe, uh, there was a big uh, challenges with a, a group of toxin called enantins, and uh, you know nobody knew that they were doing all other testing, and finally uh, they were able to detect that there are a, a new group of toxins called enant enantins, which are causing problem in chicken. Uh, so like that, you know we are learning every day. Because of these multiple toxins, uh, there are a lot of interactions uh, which are additive or synergistic, which I will explain in the next slide. And also I will introduce to a topic called masked mycotoxins, uh, which um, some of you may have heard of it, uh, but I will try to give uh, my perspective on that and how that may be a challenge to the human and animal uh, health. So this uh, slide uh, I had put together quite long ago. This is from the Mycotoxin Blue Book, where I was also one of the author uh, in this book. Uh, we are very clearly shown uh, that uh, when you have multiple toxins, even at low levels, there is a synergy. Um, you know, so you can see, read yourself for Aflon, Okra, Aflon, DAS, Aflon, T2. So most of the toxins we see in India uh, especially aflatoxin, octotoxin, and T2, all the three have synergistic interaction among themselves, leading to much higher toxicity. And all these research papers are available if anybody is interested. So interactions, there are two kinds of, uh, there are three interactions, but for our practical purpose, there are two types. One is additive. Uh, that means, let us say, if uh, aflatoxin is causing a 50 gram reduction in the body weight, if octotoxin is causing another 50 gram, uh, if you add them together, it will become 100 grams when they are present together. In synergy means it will be more than 100 grams reduction in the body weight when Afla and Okra are together. So synergistic uh, interaction is much more uh, devastating for uh, not only mycotoxins, but for any toxicants uh, in general. So I think we have a, small, a poll here uh, just to uh, you know refresh your memory. Uh, you know, so I will ask uh, Dr. Chandani to uh, look into that. Uh, thank you, Doctor. We have the poll on the screen. We haven't received it, uh, Chandani. Uh, yes, we have, Doctor. And we oh, have okay, a okay. No problem. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Uh, 
thank you all for participating in the uh, poll. Uh, Dr. Swami, uh, the yeah. results are here. Uh, so 54% have voted for uh, the answer that they are not detected by traditional analysis methods. The question was which statement related to mast mycotoxins is wrong from the below options. Uh, okay. 30 yeah, 33% have voted for they don't contribute to animal toxicity and 13% for uh, they contribute to animal toxicity. Okay, wonderful. I think uh, that's good Good to know because so that I can explain uh, uh, a bit later. The right answer, Chandani, is that uh, they don't contribute because the question is what is wrong? As, uh, because uh, they do contribute to the toxicity uh, you know they can they cannot be analyzed by the the routine uh, methodology what we are using uh, at the moment so that is the the right answer but anyway now following slide i will give a little bit more information uh, on that so the masked mycotoxins are uh, you know they are conjugates conjugates means uh, they are bound to the toxin whether it is a glucose molecule attaching to it or you know some other a molecule uh, so, practically, when you are analyzing the mycotoxins, uh, you will not uh, analyze that uh, conjugated form. If you see the bottom side, uh, just for easy understanding, on the left-hand side, you have a, a pure Dawn uh, vomitoxin. Uh, to the right of it, you have a glucose conjugated Dawn. Uh, you can see very nicely there, the glucose molecule is attached to the Dawn. So, that is why the molecular weight is more. Because the molecular weight is more, it will not be included in the mycotoxin analysis run by HPLC, or it will not be detected even by, by ELISA. So that means there is an underestimation of the total DON, because the moment this DON3 glucose goes inside the intestine or the stomach of the chicken, the glucose molecule will be removed, removed by the enzymes like amylase enzymes. Then all of a sudden, you have a free DON, which can go into the blood circulation, causing the toxicity. Just to give an example, uh, how this can be a problematic to us, uh, there is a European Union guidance value of uh, 5 ppm for dawn in poultry. And uh, when, a, when a, a feed miller or, a, or an integrator analyze on, the, on the, their uh, sample, let's say they found only 3.5 ppm of dawn. So that means they're happy because the levels are below the European guidance. However, if you analyze for the mask down in the same sample, uh, we have seen around 2 ppm of uh, uh, masked form of down. So when you combine the 3.5 and 2 ppm together, it becomes 5.5 ppm, which is already toxic to the uh, chicken. So it is an underestimation of the problem due to the limitations in uh, analysis uh, today. So that is why the, this kind of mask toxins are causing a big challenge to the animals, also the, the diagnostic labs and also for the regulatory labs. Some labs started uh, analyzing these, but it is not very common, commonly practiced in the commercial conditions uh, uh, today. So again, to the question for the poll question, the right answer is that they do contribute to the toxicity. At the moment, they are not commercially uh, being analyzed. So uh, that is why you know, we need to come up with some practical limits or guidance values rather than the uh, European Union or FDA levels. So that is why you know, since 2010 or so, I have been putting together these numbers based on the research, based on my own practical experience. Uh, because we know that regulatory limits are are not uh, uh, you know accurate for the field conditions. Uh, so uh, definitely be in touch with our, our local sales uh, sales members. They can provide you for uh, adult chicken uh, as well as the young chicks uh, because there is a difference in the amount of toxicity uh, for the young chicks as compared to the the, the grown up uh, birds. I think we have one more poll uh, here, Chandani. Yes, launch, doctor. Yeah.
thank you all for the for attending to the poll. Uh, so the question was, which of the following parameters is the most sensitive to even very low concentrations of mycotoxins? 42% uh, have said vaccine titers, 30% have said weight gain, 21% feed intake, and 6% mortality. Okay, very good. That's uh, certainly, certainly, Chandani, the highest percentage is the right one. Uh, uh, because even at low levels of toxins, uh, they have an effect on the bursa fibricious or spleen and some of those immune organs, uh, as we have seen. Uh, sometimes the feed intake is not, not affected, weight gain is not affected in birds, but already the titers are affected. So that would that is the that is the right answer. Thank you for that. And uh, moving on, uh, you know, in terms of uh, what are the effects of these mycotoxins, uh, in particular in poultry, we are discussing today. Uh, you know, there is no organ in the body uh, in the, of the chicken is free from the effects of uh, mycotoxins. Uh, you take the gastrointestinal tract, you take the liver, kidney, spleen, uh, even uh, blood, blood brain uh, barrier functions. You know, one of my, the major subject for my PhD work was on that, studying the effect of toxins on the on the brain uh, functioning. Uh, and we know all about uh, hormonal imbalance in xeralan and toxicity in, in ruminant animals and in pigs. And, uh, you know, cytokine production, a lot of research is going on nowadays, looking at the effect of mycotoxins on cytokines. And uh, in ergot toxins, we all know that they affect uh, an excitatory effect on the nervous system. So you know, all the organs in the body pretty much are affected depending on the type of uh, toxin we are looking at, ultimately leading to the poor uh, weight gains, uh, you know, poor vaccine titers, and, uh, you know, more infectious diseases like coccidiosis uh, also uh, happens due to the interaction with mycotoxins. Just one, one or two couple of slides on the, on the, on the kind of symptoms we see. These are generally seen at very high levels of toxins. Uh, we see effect on liver, effect on kidney, and oral ulcers. We, I'm sure a lot of you have seen. Uh, this is the one uh, picture I, I took uh, long ago in breeder chickens. And then we have connection with the diarrhea, uh, poor feathering, particularly the fusarium toxins, and the impact on the gastrointestinal uh, uh, villi height and the colonization of pathogens, and a hemorrhages in in, in some cases. And just to give an example, you know, this is a study uh, from Professor Devagoda in the past, uh, looking at the impact of uh, T2 toxin on average uh, egg production. Uh, you know, as the level of T2 toxin went up, there is a significant reduction uh, in, the, in the egg production uh, in the birds. And then uh, T2 toxin reduces the efficacy of anti-coccidial drug, uh, as I mentioned to you, the pathogens and the mycotoxins interact with each other. Uh, to study this, the researcher, what they did at the age of seven days in broiler chickens, uh, you know, they inoculated them with Imeria artinella, and then at 15 days of age, uh, they did the necropsy, and, uh, you know, and between six and 15 days of age, the birds were given the lasalosin as an anticoxidial drug. If you look at the slide on the right-hand side, uh, you know, when there was uh, no lacer acid, there was 100% uh, lesions and 90% mortality. When you added the lacer acid, you know, you have controlled the coccidia. But when you start introducing the toxin at different levels, uh, again, the mortality and lesions started uh, coming back. So this is just to give an indication of the uh, interaction. This has been proven for Salmonella, E. coli, and many other mycotoxins have been and pathogens have been tested for this uh, effect. So, uh, as I mentioned in the in the beginning, uh, you know this question always comes back to me. My colleagues ask me this. Uh, many customers ask me this. Uh, sometimes we don't see uh, mycotoxin analysis results. Everything is zero. Uh, we still see uh, the challenges in animals, maybe you know diarrhea, poor FCR. As always, I tell them is that, you know, please uh, take those analyses with a, you know, uh, a pinch of salt, uh, look at, compare them along with, uh, uh, is there any animal symptoms are showing on the form? Is there any postmortem findings connected to that? So when you combine all them together, 
then you get a better better uh, uh, you know reasoning rather than just looking at the the mycotoxin value so the differential diagnosis is is very critical uh, for us to solve these uh, uh, challenges so uh, in terms of the management uh, again due to the time restriction i may not be able to go deep into everything but we all know uh, that we need to know the origin of raw materials this becomes more and more important for india as we start importing the raw materials in our last year from ukraine and the ukraine the growing conditions are very different so the kind of toxins that grow in ukraine are very different from india so along with the grains you are also importing the mycotoxins so you need to look at that you need to minimize the mold growth uh, in in the field uh, that is unfortunately not in our hands the more of agricultural challenge inspect the raw material supplier facilities this is can be done keep an eye on the raw material transportation conditions because most of the problems become more aggravated during the transportation if you don't maintain the right conditions especially in the monsoon you know so many trucks get exposed to the rain on the way transporting of grains make sure the feed mill storage facilities are clean and dry i have done number of feed mill audits uh, you know you know very well some of them are really bad you know we really have to take the, you know, keep an eye on that use an effective mold inhibitor at the right dose in the silos is is very critical uh, we have a product like filax which can be really useful to spray in the liquid form uh, at the feed mill to minimize the dust and crust in the feed mill uh, that is where i think a hasa program or some kind of a feed mill program will be very useful manage the feed flow in the poultry farm sometimes the feed gets stuck to the uh, 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 the feeders so we need to clean them once in a while and uh, very important the veterinarians keep looking at uh, for any uh, symptoms of the uh, mycotoxin related issues and uh, you know we all uh, pretty much the 100% of the indian feed uses toxin binder uh, as an insurance program so just keep an eye on the quality of those products and you know how you can uh, uh, making sure that those quality control procedures uh, are in place so with this uh, we move on to the the rapid testing uh, which is a very important part of the mycotoxin management if you don't diagnose the problem quickly uh, with a, a relatively good accuracy uh, you know you can't take up uh, any positive steps to manage it so i request to my colleague avinash uh, to do the live demo of how our mycomaster works and i'm sure later on my colleagues uh, can come there and present to you uh, in person so avinash i think you can uh, just uh, stop presenting yeah. sure one second one second avinash Okay, I will change also. To, oh, no need to change. I think. Uh, thank you, Dr. Swami. Yeah. So, so I will just uh, uh, demonstrate how exactly our MicroMaster uh, works. So, MicroMaster is a, a device, a mobile device, or particularly for useful for the fluid condition. So this is for our uh, auto nutrition. So this is micro master. This is actually a kit. It's consisting of it uh, com uh, comes with uh, two boxes, small uh, plastic box. So you can carry that one, and um, it consisting of. Uh, so you can see now. This is the major one. That this is the actually the micro master main system, and also it consisting of a mini centrifuge. A small weighing machine, a coffee grinder, and also uh, it contains with uh, uh, other accessories like uh, uh, measuring cylinders and uh, um, micro pipettes. So these are uh, uh, different uh, accessories along comes with along with that. So this MicroMaster works with the uh, the technology called uh, lateral flow uh, analysis. This is a, a lateral flow. 
analysis. Compa it's comparative. It's a very similar to the uh, uh, ELISA technique. Uh, you can say that one. It's the uh, like ELISA. It's uh, they both are immunological techniques. So, but slightly actually, uh, the, the percentage, but actually the the way it works, it's a little bit different. So, ELISA requires a laboratory environment, whereas uh, and also skilled people for to work. But whereas the MicroMaster doesn't require any really real uh, skill work. So only thing one, you know, one can be, uh, if you know some things uh, like using a micro pipette, that's, that will be the uh, good thing. I, I, that will be enough for anybody to can uh, uh, operate this instrument. So now I'll just uh, demonstrate uh, a sample analysis. I'm just taking a sample uh, from a, uh, uh, this is a, the, the field sample uh, from the, uh, this is a dairy uh, feed sample. This is first has to be ground. The sample has to be ground. Then we have to weigh 50 gram of sample. So we have to take a 50 gram of samples. I have taken 50 gram sample. So here, and so we have to add, there is a, a extraction powder. This comes in a small pouch, this is ready made. So this extract powder is already added to that one. So 50 gram we have to take. So then, so we have to add, 150 ml of water. This is 150 ml of water. And so it has to be mixed. So I am mixing with, I'm just mixing with the uh, with the water. So just plain water, it, you, uh, it doesn't require any distilled water or you can use any plain water, no problem. So it comes with, a, this also, it cups also comes with a kit. So it has to be closed with a lid. So you have to, Shake it for two minutes, like that. So a hard shaking for two minutes. So already uh, we have taken the sh uh, shake, and you have to transfer this liquid actually after uh, allowing it for two minutes. So this will be extraction will be like this. So after that, so you have to take in, take the samples into um, micro micro centrifuge tubes. So I have already taken the micro centrifuge tape uh, for already uh, prepared it one. Then we have to keep it in the centrifuge and it for 40 seconds. So already has centrifuge so for that one. So this centrifuge after centrifugation, this is our already now I have collected the centrifuge that you've been collected. So that has to be transferred now. So to transfer this because this is a, again it may contain some of the impurities so that has to pass through a membrane filter so this is a membrane filter it requires a membrane filter uh, a syringe then it has to be so, yes. so i'm transferring to the the content a small uh, this one so i'm just pushing so that so you can see this how this is a collection so already i made the collection so this is the this is the extraction so what i know what the extraction so extraction now so this is now the extraction is ready now this is the sample is ready for analysis the final analysis now i have to take around 300 microliter of this sample so this is a micro pipette so i have set it for the 300 microliter so i have to take 300 microliter of this sample Taking 300 microliter of samples, that has to be transferred to another test tube containing a buffer. So, a dilution buffer is already added. I have already added. This is also comes with a kit. This is a, a fluoroxin, it's a dilution buffer. So, this also comes with a kit. So, we have to add 600 microliters is normally this is a one is to three dilution because there are the different types of dilutions are there so one is a two point two is to five and one is to three dilution series because for this uh assembly i am using one is to three 
assay. So one is to three dilution assay. Now after mixing that, you have to uh, thoroughly shake it and homogenize. It. Now this uh, sample is ready for the final analysis. Now this is actually so I am taking the uh, microtoxin uh, strip. Uh, sorry, Avinash, just one interruption. Yeah. About that yeah. we've been yeah. giving. Uh, uh, feedback from some of the participants that they are not able to view the video. Uh, that okay. would be of network issues. However, okay. I just want to start that you'll also receive a recording of this video. In case you're not able to see the live demo right now, we will also be sharing the video, the recording of this video. Thank you. Uh, kindly continue. Okay. Now this is a this is a microtoxin strip. So particularly, I'm using these are all color coded, and the different type of uh, strips are available. Particularly, six type of uh, strips are available. So this strip is uh, particularly stands good for uh, holds good for uh, aflatoxin. It is having a color. So uh, uh, this is uh, uh, actually purple colored uh, structure. Uh, this is uh, in a tip. So this uh, MicroMaster will uh, recognize this particular strip by this color coding. Now I am inserting this strip into the actually this is a slot. So here you can see the slot. This is the slot. So I have to insert. So I have inserted the slot. So immediately after that one, it recognizes the MicroMaster is because this is because of some uh, issues. So we cannot clearly see what exactly that's coming. So here. When it comes, it tells the aflatoxin, and also it will tell you the different the raw material you can use. So this this micro micro master can recognize 40 different of matrices. So 40, more than 40 different matrices it can. So we have got a calibrations. So we can use the around 40 um, uh, uh, this one include raw materials and also uh, the final field samples. So this, since it's a field sample, is from uh, uh, this uh, uh, coming from the dairy. So I am going to select the dairy cattle. It's a ruminant feed. It's been written ruminant feed. So when I enter the ruminant feed, so it, then it will ask ask us to give the credentials. So first it will ask her actually who is the operator. So since I'm operator, I'm just uh, uh, putting my name and just putting it. Then, so it will also ask me to the sample ID because it can be just uh, you can you have to identify the sample ID. Just I'm just putting it as a demo. So just it's a demo, and also it it will ask lot number. If it's any lot number is there, you can specify that one, and also the country of origin. So since it's from India, I just put it IN. So India, then also, so it will ask for the supplier. The, who is the supplier of this? You can enter that everything. And uh, just now, now I entered all the details. Now this is a sample is ready for. So here it's all, all the sample also containing actually a small heater. So temperature is maintained around 45 degrees Celsius. So we have to maintain because the heater it will maintain. So now there is a small slit. I will show you later. So now this is a sample. I am just going to uh, put the sample. I have to load the sample. So for this one, you have to take 300 microliter of the sample. It's already prepared in the buffer. This diluted sample already. This is a, I have taken 300 microliter of the sample. So in this area, so just so. So I will show you maybe you know I just want to demonstrate. So this is a strip. So you can uh, see the strip. So this is S. This actually in the back side. So you will there's a sponge. The spongy pad is there. So it is enclosed in a plastic case. So now there is a slit here. So just peel off this slit. So there is a groove here. So there is a groove inside here. So here you have to do your sample. So already this is being used. So now I'm opening here. 
so just i am putting this in the sample i have already loaded so put in the 300 microliter and immediately close this one when we close the lids the reaction will start so that that will move the sample will move so initially there was a there was a you know, here it's a um, movement will be there and after you can see some the development of color actually after 5 minutes so you will see the movement of the color there is a mark here that's a c t1 and t2 test 1 and test 2 and control this control is very high uh, sorry so, sorry to interrupt avinash just maybe because of the time so yeah. uh, just to conclude that uh, basically here the now uh, the incubation time is going on after the 5 minutes of uh, incubation we will get the results in ppb right avinash yes 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 Sorry, sorry to interrupt you because we have lack of time, uh, yeah, yeah. but uh, certainly thank you so much. That has uh, been very useful and uh, we move back to our presentation, but later on, uh, you know, just messages, uh, we ask how much is the sample uh, PPB you got, we will inform the uh, uh, audience. Okay, that should, that, that okay. should be great. Thank you very okay. much. Okay, thank you, thank you, thank you. So thank you, thank you everyone uh, for for your uh, uh, patience on those. I'm certainly, you know, when our team comes, uh, it will be a much uh, a much better way of uh, looking at that. Uh, you know, physically you can see the uh, instrument. So moving on to the uh, next slide, uh, Chandini. I think we have one more poll here. If you can do that. Yeah, sure, doctor. Yeah, please. Uh for all the poll would be visible on your screen. This is an interesting question. It applies to their operations. So hopefully uh, we get some idea. Uh, thank you all for participating. Uh, the results are here, doctor. So the yeah. question was, when do you subject your raw materials for mycotoxin analysis? 73% have said both A and B. Uh, B okay. is 23% to accept or reject raw materials and 3% A option, which is uh, when there is a problem in bird performance and health. Okay, very good. So pretty much they are using for both the uh, to know when there is a problem in performance but also they accept or reject the raw materials okay thanks uh, thanks chandini so moving on uh, you know what uh, avinash just showed us uh, everybody able to see my slide again uh, uh, chandini uh, yes, you can see my slide okay great uh, so we get all this information just now what Avinash was demonstrating from different parts of the world. We have more than 250 uh, MicroMasters and, uh, you know, the data coming out of that. Uh, last year we had like 22,000 data points and that we use it for a number of uh, reasons, uh, you know, just to give an idea about what is the global uh, contamination. Uh, we saw last year was quite bad, uh, you know, more than 90% of the samples had a quantifiable level of DAWN, not necessarily a toxic level, but it was quantifiable. And also fibonacin and aflatoxins were the following uh, major, major toxins. And also remember that uh, just mere the detection may not be causing uh, problems in animals. So about 60 to 65% of the samples had the levels of toxins which can really cause problem to the to the animal, and this also helps us to uh, understand you know, what is the mean concentration of mycotoxins in these raw materials, uh, what is the median, what is the range, what, you know, what is the worst sample. For example, in Dawn, in this case, we had a sample of twenty six thousand ppb, uh, whereas the lowest many of them were zero also. So it you know it is an average and and, and the median they give a very good idea for us to look at uh, the potential uh, toxicity. And on additional way we use this uh, database is those customers or feed millers, integrators who are connecting uh, their MicroMaster to our central database, 
uh, they also get the advice on uh, can they use that raw material, what percentage of raw materials, is, and how much toxin binder they can use, and they get the recommendations. So, like uh, you can see on, on this side, how many of the samples they tested were risk samples, how many were okay to use, and uh, that full information will be will be available. So now I would give the control to uh, Dr. Sabiha. Uh, very quickly, she will take you through the uh, you know website uh, showing uh, some of these uh, advices on the on the mycotoxin. Dr. Sabiha, please go ahead. Thank you, Doctor. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, now we have seen that uh, we know that the mycotoxin contamination levels coming up from various analytical methods and the way the big data that we have is being integrated. The next step is to understand how we evaluate this risk level for poultry based on the different contamination levels. And we do that through the mycotoxin advisor. Uh, so if we click on that, it, it is, as Dr. Swami was mentioning, it's only accessible for those who are uh, integrated to the MycoMaster and it carries out the risk analysis at three levels. So at, uh, you know, by way of measurement, uh, by risk profile and by analysis report. Uh, so uh, I will just go through each of the vertical to show you uh, what picture it gives. So uh, when you click on the measurements, it's uh, nothing other than uh, the uh, reports uh, that are being generated from the MicroMaster. Uh, that will give you an idea of the uh, mycotoxin contamination level that is present for that specific raw material. So here you have the liberty to, uh, you know, uh, choose the mycotoxin uh, 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 you want to check for. So whether it's Atla or Okra or T2, uh, the type of raw material uh, you want to uh, check. And uh, based on that, the, the, that specific uh, reports will get popped up. And then uh, you have this icon uh, through which you can have a look at the uh, measurement level. So for example, uh, this was a wheat sample that was uh, analyzed for uh, five uh, mycotoxins, and uh, these are the results that uh, were uh, uh, present in those raw material in the wheat. So this is just to give an indication of the uh, mycotoxin levels that are present in uh, the commodities that we are using. Next one is to assess the risk profile. So here, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, uh, you are at liberty to uh, assign values, you know, the threshold val limits for your uh, uh, species that you are rearing. So for example, you can select the mycotoxin you want and the species you want, and you can set in tolerance limits. So you already have some default values. So these are the limits set by us, by Trow, for you to have an indication of what is the low low tolerance level, what, what is it meant by medium tolerance level, and uh, what are the levels that indicate high tolerance. Nevertheless, you can also put in here values on your own, uh, so as uh, maybe your levels out of, uh, out of the practical experience that you have gained over years, you can put the levels that you seem as uh, low, medium, and high. That was with the profile, and then you can evaluate the risk. So here it's all about customization. So you can uh, have samples uh, from your own company or uh, from uh, from the contract uh, farms, etc. And uh, you can, uh, you know, uh, name them as own on uh, external and uh, then customize it if you want it for, uh, uh, want the profile to be, uh, you know, risk to be analyzed for a, a low category or medium category, etc. And then you select the species. So we have it for uh, uh, across the species we have. So you, you, you select the species that you're interested in, maybe here broilers and laying hens, and then save that. And then we go back to the third vertical, which is the main one uh, that will talk of the, you know, uh, uh, the risk that is probably that might come in from the, from the mycotoxin levels that are present in your uh, uh, raw materials and give an indication on how it has to be handled. So here, you can select the measurement for which you want to carry out the risk analysis, maybe for us a uh, uh, layer feed. The species obviously will be laying hands. Tolerance level. 
may be high and then the inclusion of that so if you are selecting the raw materials they may be like you know if you're selecting maize or soya you can give like 50 or 30 percent uh, respectively but because this is a feed we give it as 100 on samples and then you can start generating the report so so it generates a report saying that you know uh, the high tolerance level is 20 ppb for that feed so for laying hands uh, and the probability to exceed this level is 59 percent means 59 percent uh, is the probability for it to go more than 20 ppb so what is the risk associated and what is the recommendation that we say is that uh, you know you analyze this uh, uh, feed stuff uh, adequately and uh, uh, you need to add a, a toxin binder a toxo range that is available with us according to the recommendations uh, from our technical expert so so th this is this is the one which gives an analysis of the if it's going to be low levels it will say your feed is perfectly fine and uh, you can go ahead uh, with uh, with uh, usage of that feed so that's it uh, from my end uh, over to you dr swami thank you thank you dr sabiha so back to my screen uh, chandini at this stage what i would recommend is if there are a couple of questions we can take because since I will be going on a little bit on to the product and the technology. So if you have a couple of questions, we'll be happy to answer at uh, this stage, uh, Chandani. So uh, if anybody has a question, yeah. Uh, as of now, uh, we don't have uh, questions. So I would suggest okay. you to please. Okay, okay, okay. Thank you. So basically, you know, I will just take another uh, 10 minutes, uh, 10, 12 minutes. Uh, uh, we are, uh, you know, we still leave about five, six minutes for questions. Uh, so I've been involved heavily on, on the research development of our, our technologies. And the good news is that, uh, you know, in India, we have developed a, a microtoxin research collaboration with Bangalore Veterinary College. So we have done a lot of research here. I would like to present a couple of those uh, without going too much in detail. So this is the a broad view of our uh, Toxo range. Uh, you know, my colleagues, uh, salespeople would be able to convey you more information uh, in the coming days uh, uh, and months. Uh, so when you have a, a high levels of aflatoxins, uh, to some extent ergot toxins and also bacterial toxins, endotoxins, uh, we have Toxo MX, uh, which is a very high quality smectite clay. Uh, works uh, really good uh, for that. Uh, many customers are using, uh, including in the dairy segment, we use in, in the Nestle to control of the toxin uh, uh, in the milk. And then we have a Toxo product, which has got uh, glucose biopolymers, uh, because number of slides, you have seen the impact of these mycotoxins on the gut health, uh, particularly Dawn, T2, Fimonosins, Ocrotoxins. They may not cause a significant impact on the feed intake, uh, uh, you know, the levels may not be there to cause the intake issues in poultry, but they are known to affect the gut health, uh, gut health integrity, especially the tight junction proteins. So that is why we are adding a, a glucose biopolymer, a specific compound to improve the gut health of these uh, chickens exposed to the mycotoxins. And then we also know that uh, many of these mycotoxins are uh, compromising the immune system. So that is the Toxo XL is our, uh, the most broad spectrum product uh, where it will not only uh, take care of mycotoxins, multiple toxins, uh, but also the immune uh, uh, modulation or improvement in the immune response uh, can be expected uh, because they have a very high quality uh, beta glucans, exposed beta glucans, which helps in uh, uh, improving the immune system of the chicken. So with that, uh, uh, due to the lack of time, I uh, just want to update you that uh, our uh, uh, you know, smectite clay has shown more than 90% of binding to aflatoxins, ergot toxins, and also the endotoxins, uh, which are bacterial toxins. Also, uh, please remember that the clays are not uh, proven to be uh, against some of the pesticides, insecticides in the market. You know, There is a lot of discussion on that. 
but unfortunately there is no scientific in you know, a lot of people ask us also uh, you know we don't have any scientific research uh, as well as anybody else in the at the moment uh, in the marketplace so we also looked at the the safety of our uh, uh, products is very important uh, they are they are free from heavy metals uh, they are free from uh, dioxins we regularly check them they don't bind uh, amino acids uh, one of the research we did uh, some customers are asking us you know does your clay binds methionine tryptophan we we did some work on that we also tested the high levels of our product with uh, iron copper zinc and couple of vitamins uh, you know a very little um, uh, impact on the vitamins but no impact on the minerals at all so very negligible impact uh, you know uh, which is which is good uh, because in historically we know that clays were binding a lot of nutrients the endotoxin is something new for us uh, we looked at uh, bacterial toxins uh, particularly produced by e coli and uh, our toxomx product uh, was very good able to bind uh, uh, you know between 75 to 90 91% of uh, endotoxins so when there are less endotoxins uh, the birds will perform better this was published recently at world mycotoxin uh, forum so the this study was done at the bangalore veterinary college uh, under the guidance of professor uh, malathi uh, after professor devagoda she has been doing a fantastic work in this research institute we collaborated with her on our two technologies uh, particularly in this slide you look at toxo mx uh, we used uh, very high levels of aflatoxins 500 ppb or 0.5 ppm and we used the product at 2 kilos uh, per ton uh, as you can see here uh, when you use uh, the uh, high levels of uh, flatoxin, the body weight came down from 2393 to 1801, uh, more close to 600 grams drop in, feed, uh, in, the, in the final weight. And with our product, we were able to improve it back to 2069. And the FCR again, uh, almost like 30 points improvement in the FCR. Uh, we know that is a very high number, uh, but again, remember that we used a very high levels of uh, toxins. So we looked at the return on investment, a uh, very good return on investment, uh, you know, 15 to one, uh, you know, even considering the highest price of the Toxo, Toxo MX, we were able to uh, see this benefit, but we all know that even if you see five to one in the field, I'm sure you will be very happy to uh, take that. And then uh, the gut wall protection is our second mode of action with the glucose biopolymer. Uh, I mentioned briefly that when there are toxins and pathogens, uh, they have an impact on the gut, uh, uh, you know, integrity, the barrier uh, junction proteins in between the two epithelial cells. You now, when they are damaged, uh, there is increased inflammation, uh, integrity is poor, and there is more bacteria and toxins going into the blood, blood circulation. So for that, we did a, a recently a research uh, in Canada uh, we looked at Dawn, uh, as I mentioned to you, these are the toxins having impact on the gut integrity. And uh, we used a 6 ppm of Dawn, a very high level of Dawn. We used the product of ToxoXL at 2 kg per ton. Uh, you can see uh, that the ratio of will I height to the creep depth was poor uh, in the control, in the toxin group, and it is improved by our product. And we all know that will I height to creep depth ratio is a very good indicator of a good good gut health and then the last part is immune modulation uh, so basically uh, you know all the mycotoxins have an impact on the immune system like macrophage activity lymphocyte proliferation vaccine efficacy uh, you know that's why sometimes you see poor vaccines in spite of giving a good quality vaccine uh, so you know we have the, as i mentioned you beta glucans uh, these are uh, obtained from the cell wall of yeast uh, particularly on the inner part of the cell wall. We enzymatically extract these beta glucans. Uh, we have patented this product and we clearly see in the right hand side uh, a much better effect in stimulating the immune cells as compared to some of the competition uh, uh, in the marketplace. Uh, so certainly uh, we see an improvement in the immune response when we use such kind of uh, immune modulators. So again, we went to uh, Bangalore College, we studied ToxoXL, but instead of using only aflatoxins, we used the combination of three toxins, aflaocra and T2, 
all at 250 ppb level again a bit of a big challenge uh, but we used our product at 1.35 and 3 kilos here so as expected uh, we saw a significant reduction in the end weight uh, you know almost uh, like 300 grams reduction then with our product we were able to uh, bring back the body weight not comparable to control but there is a significant uh, uh, improvement same thing with fcr we found uh, you know close to uh, all the way from uh, 20 points fcr improvements uh, in the high level sub binder uh, to about 8 points improvements uh, in the in the low level of binder so antibody titers uh, we as we expected uh, there is a significant reduction at day 42 for newcastle disease and with our product both the products uh, doses were able to improve the antibody titers uh, as compared to the toxin group uh, whereas the uh, only the uh, in the high level of our product was effective uh, at uh, day 21 for ibd uh, but both are effective uh, for ibd at day 40 42 so clearly showing uh, that there is an immune modulation coming by preventing the toxin uh, as well as improving the uh, immune cells the return on investment was a bit moderate here uh, because of the high uh, impact of multiple toxins uh, we saw somewhere between 1 to uh, 2.6 to 1 to 3.4 uh, again uh, quite considerable given the the level of toxin we saw in the research so with that, I just want to conclude uh, that, uh, you know, the mycotoxin is not a rocket science anymore for any of us, uh, but uh, we continue to uh, identify new toxins. Uh, and, uh, you know, we try to correlate those toxins uh, to the, the animal symptoms we see. Uh, and we know the economic losses affect performance. It affects health. And also, so many, so much money is getting into the regulation of these toxins. Uh, you know that so economic loss is quite, quite, uh, quite deep. And so that is why you know it is should be an integrated approach. Uh, you know it can't be relying only on the toxin binder per se. So it should be a, a complete approach for us to manage them so that we prevent the entry of this toxin in the feed chain but also preventing this entry of into the bloodstream. That's where the toxin binders, gut health, immune modulation will help. So the you know, innovative technologies are, are very key. We continue to work on that, uh, and we will present to you as we develop new, new technologies. Uh, but at the moment, I think we have uh, good technologies to take care of at least the challenges in, uh, in poultry segment. So with that, uh, we will be very, very happy to uh, take uh, any questions. Uh, thank you for your, your time. And uh, yeah, so uh, we will, again, as a team, we thank you for your time and we'll be happy to take questions. Uh, thank you, doctor. And uh, thank you to all the participants uh, for uh, listening to us. Uh, we'll be taking up the questions now. And uh, I will also, unmute all the participants so that in case you're not able to type in it in the question box you'll gain the control over your audio and you'll be able to unmute yourselves uh, in the meantime doctor we have some questions with us our, okay. uh, our first question is is there any research about uh, broiler breeders uh, the broiler breeder at the moment uh, we don't have uh, Chandani. We are already uh, planning uh, some trials uh, in India also, uh, uh, in, in uh, abroad also. We are looking at you know uh, in the universities also nowadays uh, not many people are keeping the broiler breeders. You know we tried a lot in India, uh, in other countries, uh, and in the field uh, the challenge is that we can't do a statistical analysis. So that is where we are kind of uh, in the contemplation. Uh, but yeah, we have identified few few places uh, in India to do that, and we are also working in Mexico and Brazil to find the suitable researchers for that. Uh, thank you, Doctor. Uh, another question that we have is, uh, if we can reduce the dosage of toxin binders like Toxoexcel uh, with the veg and non-veg feeds, as the LTS level will vary considering presence of bacteria in non-veg feeds. 
Yeah, uh, definitely. I think uh, uh, one good thing we have observed, uh, uh, Dr. Chandini, and also the uh, the person who asked the question is, uh, one of the reasons why we are looking at immune modulation was that uh, sometimes, so you know, depending upon the uh, the kind of uh, products they use, they may be contributing to the pathogens. Uh, so in such scenario, also the immunomodulatory, the gut health benefits of the components inside our product uh, will will give some advantage to the, uh, the maintaining the health of these. So yeah, certainly uh, the level of toxins are quite high. If you in in the field, I'm sure you all agree that we don't see more than 50 ppv of these toxins. Uh, so for those levels, even a, you know one kilo uh, or on the, in the maintenance level of even 500 grams, the product works. Uh, but for the research purpose, we always go at high level uh, to show the significant differences. And also, these are some of the student projects. It's very important for them to find uh, significant differences for their research also. That's why we use such levels. Uh, thank you, Doctor. Uh, uh, another question is that what are the factors that binds LPS from bacteria in uh, our toxin binder? Yeah, uh, the it is purely smectite clay uh, because uh, the clay we are looking at. You know, maybe one another thing I wanted to uh, maybe tell the audience here. You know, because now I'm a bit more involved at the global level in product development. Uh, you know, all clays are not the same. You know, that is what my impression in the past, but now I am learning there's so many different kinds of clays. There are so many different processes. We can, uh, uh, you know, activate these clays. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> Uh, so, you know, those those are the things. Yeah, definitely the quality of the clay becomes very important. Now I understand, uh, you know, so much of research uh, we are doing in right, identifying the right clay from different parts of the world and sticking that formula and uh, doing the quality control uh, is, is very critical. So, yeah, certainly identification of that clay is the reason why we are able to come up with endotoxin binding, binding the smectite clay. It's purely a clay binding. Uh, thank you, Doctor. Uh, our next question is, uh, how about the non-polar toxins, which will be neutralized mainly by biotransformation? Uh, does toxin range have any components for biotransformation? Very good question. Uh, I think uh, due, due to lack of time, I was not able to focus on the biotransformation. Uh, the biotransformation mechanism uh, is partic particularly works well against Dawn uh, and Zeralanan. Uh, you know, fortunately, you know, in, 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 in poultry, these two toxins are not very toxic. Uh, that is why what we have seen is more than the biotransformation, anything that can improve the overall gut health and the immune system of the chicken seems to be a better option. But the biotransformation works well in pigs uh, because of the pigs are very sensitive to uh, vomitoxin and zeralanan. Whereas poultry, a very uh, zeralanan, hundred percent non-toxic. I think there is a mis misleading information in the market. Zeralanan is not toxic at all to the chicken, and whereas for dawn, a very low toxicity compared to the uh, pigs. So those are the reasons why I don't think we need a biotransformation mechanism for poultry. Uh, anything that improve the immune system and the gut health should be able to take care of the challenges. Uh, thank you, Doctor. And our next question is something that we were also discussing uh, today during the afternoon. Uh, the, the question is that customers these days are facing issue of toxins due to chemical and pesticides. So right. uh, how can uh, our product or you know other mycotoxin binders overcome that? <laughs> this is a, a, a long uh, pending question, uh, uh, Dr. Chandini. You know, it's, uh, uh, people, uh, industry is asking for that. No doubt about that. We all know, uh, you know, within 15 years uh, in Indian market, we try to focus in many companies I work for. But uh, uh, the challenge is that there is there are so many different pesticides and insecticides in in the in the market, and uh, unfortunately, no one has. Uh, uh, published the peer reviewed research uh, you know, at any conferences and things like that to prove that 
the pesticide which is causing a problem in India is uh, they are able to capable of binding those uh, pesticides. Uh, that is why without that lack of info, in fact, uh, until we published our work in World Mycotoxin Forum, I never allowed my colleagues to talk about endotoxins. So it is very important that we have a science uh, behind uh, the products and without that making claims is, is not good. I think the pesticide and insecticides fall into that. I really hope that whoever comes up with the, uh, with the more research behind that, uh, there is a need, but I would strongly say that it should not be positioned as a toxin binder. It should be pos positioned as a chemical toxin binder, a separate segment, uh, so that people can evaluate the benefit of that uh, product. And mixing that along with uh, mycotoxin binder is too much for one product to work against uh, so many different toxins. Uh, thank you, doctor. And because of constraint of time, we'll be taking up last two questions now. So our second last okay. question is, uh, does choline chloride in feed affect the quality of our toxin binder because of its corrosive nature? Choline chloride, right? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Choline yeah, yeah, choline chloride. Yeah, it. Uh, I think it is. Uh, it is not going to impact the effect of toxin binder. The reason being, uh, the toxin binder does not work uh, inside inside the feed. It works inside the gut. But if you are using a biotransformation mechanism, or if you are using uh, any other live organisms, enzymes. Uh, they may be get affected because of the interaction with the choline clumping of feed, you know those, those kind those kind of things. But clays, I I think they they are they are not going to be affected by the choline chloride. Uh, thank you, doctor. Our last question for the day is: uh, Toxoxyl causes immunomodulation, uh, as has yeah. been stated in the presentation. So, are yeah. we supposed to? or remove vitamin E and selenium uh, uh, if giving extra supplementation? If you are giving extra uh, as an immune modulator, yes, certainly you can do that because uh, this is a very strong immune modulator, but you know I, you should not remove it from your uh, feeds, regular feed formulation. But if you're using as a treatment purpose, uh, your selenium and uh, vitamin E, I, I think uh, the beta glucans are quite competent to uh, quite competent to do that job, uh, but not out of your regular formula. Uh, thank you, doctor. And that was our last question because uh, we ran out of time. Uh, but for all the participants, I would just like to say that uh, any all the other questions uh, that we've received, we'll definitely be answering that, and uh, we'll personally be reaching out to you. Uh, and we'll also be providing your answers to all the questions that we've, we, we've received today. Uh, with that, we'll be ending the session. And uh, thank you, uh, doctors, for your presentation. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sabia, Dr. Swami, and uh, Mr. Avinash. Uh, and thank you, everyone, for joining us today in this webinar. Uh, we realize that uh, you take this time out of your busy schedules, and we are extremely grateful for that. And we hope that uh, you were able to take at least a few uh, key points from the presentation. Uh, thank you again. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, thanks, everyone. Thanks for the organization. Take care. Bye-bye.